Today, Paul's going to show us how with the coming of Christ, we too have been brought into the family. We've been adopted as sons and daughters of the Most High. On this Christmas Eve, I want us to realize what has been done for us. Not only with the incarnation of Jesus Christ, not only with His death and resurrection on the cross, which is absolutely amazing, but with what He has done through that act in changing us and bringing us into the family. Would you pray with me? And we'll look at Galatians together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we gather here on this cold morning, we are delighted to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is this time of year that the whole world seems to celebrate this. But it is often divorced from the very reason for which He came. To take on the death that was due for us, that we had earned rightly through our own sin, for we have been created for worship, and yet all of your creation has rebelled against you. And when the Prince of, Prince of Heaven sunk himself into human flesh and said, I will go, I will pay the price that our triune God might have a relationship. Those two acts, His birth and His death and resurrection, are inextricably linked. And I pray that we would not separate them today as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Father, for those here today who have yet to repent of their sin and place their faith in Jesus Christ, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. That their hearts would be strangely warmed. That the scales would fall from their eyes. And that they would realize who this baby in the manger is. For those of us who have committed our life to Jesus Christ through the gift of faith, I pray that we would rejoice this morning. I pray that this would be a time of worship that we would delight in celebrating His birthday. We love You. We praise You. And we give You all the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, turn to... Galatians, as I mentioned, chapter 1. I want to give us a little bit of background and tell you why Paul is writing this book. Look down at verse 6. He tells us right off the bat, he says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not really another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. He's writing to these churches in Galatia. There's some dispute about whether it's North Galatia or South Galatia. But suffice it to say, Paul knew these folks and he says, I'm hearing some bad news. That you're taking this truth that we've given you, this gospel, God's spell, this good news, and you're trading it for a different good news, which is really not good news at all. It's not really truth at all. And so it begs the question as you start to read this book, what is this different gospel? We'll turn one page over and look at chapter 2, verse 16. He tells us. It says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be glorified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. In my copy here, I, I, I underlined, not justified by works of the law. Not by works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Look down at verse 21, the second part. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. What was the point of the cross? You see, apparently behind Paul and Barnabas, there was a group of teachers called Judaizers, false teachers. They were Jewish teachers who embraced the need for faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed He died on the cross for their sins and rose again from the dead. But as they're preaching this gospel to the Gentiles, they sort of saw that faith as just first base. Just step one. But if you really wanted to be saved, you needed to 
embrace and obey the Mosaic Law. So it's this this synergistic uh, relationship whereby sort of the grace of Jesus Christ comes through the cross, but you got to complete it on your own. you got to get justified on your own. In order to really get saved, you have to live by the law, by good works. Look at chapter 3, verse 3. Paul swings a heavy bat. He says, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, now you're being perfected by the flesh? Having placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you're now trying to earn your salvation by being obedient to the law? He says, this makes no sense whatsoever. I want to give you this background because this is what Paul is dealing with, and he's not there to help correct this teaching. So he's writing this letter, and he's telling them to hold fast to the purity of the grace of God. But then this begs another question. Does that mean that the law is worthless? That the law is no good? We have to ask ourselves the same question. We have this this Bible that has the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if you're an evangelical, we spend a lot of time in the New Testament, right? Every church across America today is in the New Testament. Probably in Luke 2, right? Maybe in Matthew 1 or 2, but probably in the New Testament. Do we believe that the Old Testament is passé, is done with? That it was, it was good, but when Christ came, we just sort of included in there like a good reference point. A good lexicon. So turn to chapter 3. Paul brings up another question in verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God. Okay, what's the promise of God? You remember? Genesis chapter 12, God appears to Abraham. He calls him out of the earth of the Chaldees and He says, I'm going to promise you something. And it's not dependent upon you, it's dependent upon me as God. And he promises him three things. Land, seed, and blessing. Now we saw the temporal fulfillment, seed, coming through him and his barren wife in Isaac. But the ultimate seed was going to be the Messiah. And we saw how over time, with with the coming of David and other prophecies, that the Jews were expecting a promise. And that promise was the Amashia, the Anointed One, the King. And so Paul is saying, do you think that just because I'm emphasizing that we're saved by sola fide, faith alone, that the law is no longer good? Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Look what he says. May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would have been based on the law. He's saying, I'm not saying the law is bad. 21st century Christians at Metro Bible The Mosaic Law of the Old Testament is not bad. I'm just saying it won't save. We've been talking about uses of the law. The three uses of the law. The first one, how it's this this road sign to the cross. It's meant to show us the righteousness of God and how we could never attain to it. And so we're meant to read the Old Testament and say, I can't get there. I, I can't do that. I can't live up to that. If all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, well, I'm already behind. There's no way I can attain the perfection required that God requires to have a relationship with us. So the law was meant to say, you have fallen short of the glory of God. You're a sinner and you deserve death. Therefore, look to the cross. That was the first use use of the law. The second one, was to maintain societal or civil order. You've heard me say that those who will not be controlled from within must be controlled from without. It's our laws. It maintains order. And then the third use of the law is a manual as to how believers should live. That this is what God likes. This is what He considers uh, good and holy. Therefore, we want to obey Him because we love Him. So Paul brings this up and he's trying to shepherd the hearts of the Galatians. 
And he says, I want to show you that the law is good primarily in that it points to the cross. It won't save you, but it points to the cross. Now look at verses 22. I'm going to give us an overview and then we're going to dive in for a few moments and we're going to see this relationship of going from a slave to a son. Look at verse 22. He says, this is what it's like under the law. This is what it's like prior to coming to Christ. Verse 22, chapter 3. But the Scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. He's basically saying under the law, we are like slaves. We're locked up. We're shut up. It only shows us we can't do it. But then things have changed with the coming of the promise, with the coming of the Messiah. Verse 25, but now that faith has come, what does it say? We are no longer under a tutor. Verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And even more than a son or a daughter, look at verse 29, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to a promise. Do you see the progression? That the law is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But it's not something that will save you. It's something that will guide you like a tutor, like a teacher. But when Christ comes, it's like, it's like we hear that news that we've been adopted. That we're now sons and daughters of the Most High. And today, in the next 15, 20 minutes, I want us to look at a photo album, right? We do a lot of this around Christmas time, right? You go to grandma's house, someone pulls out the photo albums. You know, some of us cringe a little bit because you see the before and after pictures, right? There's like, oh, there's Rod with a mullet and parachute pants, okay? You know, everyone laughs every year, okay? But it's important to have the before because then what does the after look like? exciting. It's great to see a change. So we're going to look at a before and after picture today. First picture, picture of us as slaves. And secondly, the picture of us as sons. Look at verse 4. We're going to cover 1 through 7 here. He's going to expound on what he just told us. Now, I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is the owner of everything. The Greek word for child is made up of two words. It means one that does not speak. It is a child that though he may be in the household, he can't do much, can't say anything. And in Roman times, a child's status was roughly that of a slave because of his restrictions and his lack of freedom. Verse 2 explains why. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. Household slaves are called guardians and managers. Paul calls them tutors here. And a tutor was responsible for the education and the protection of a child until the age of 14. And tutors were known and expected to be strict disciplinarians. They were to make sure that the child stayed out of the way of the parents, that he or she got educated and that they learned everything and didn't get in trouble. Okay? Even for the Jews, they could, they could understand this because what celebration do you have at age 12? A bar mitzvah, okay? A son bar of the commandment. That's when you become of age or an adult. So, Paul is saying that you guys all understand what it's like to be a child in a home, under a guardian, under a tutor. That though you may be in the house, though you may know your father, you're not really a son. In fact, you're, you're actually closer to a slave because you're so restricted. This is what it's like prior to the coming of the Messiah. That what we had in the Old Testament, what we had in the law, was words and books that talked about the holiness of God and the depravity of man. 
But that's all it could really show us. Now, side note here, let me just back up a little bit and talk about soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. People in the Old Testament are saved in the same way they are in the New Testament. Faith in God, faith in Yahweh, and in His coming promise, okay? We know from chapter 3 it says, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as what? Righteousness, okay? So we know that that faith, people are saved by grace through faith. But it wasn't until the coming of the Messiah that the price was paid, that salvation was effected. And so what we see in the law, again, is this big neon sign saying, you can't do it on your own. So now remember his audience. Who is his audience? Galatian churches who've listened to Judaizers saying, Jesus is the Christ. But if you really want to be saved, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to obey Shabbat. You've got to do these festivals. You've got to fast twice a week. You see what I'm saying? Paul is saying, that's crazy. No, let me explain to you that the law is good, but here is its purpose. The law could only point us to Christ. It could only discipline us and guide us, much like a tutor when you were a child. But it could also guide us through pictures. When we talk about this photo album, one of those pictures was the high holy day of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur came a week after uh, Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah was the new year. Yom Kippur is called the day of literally covering or atonement. And this is what would happen. The shofar, the ram's horn, is blown at the end of the evening prayer service for the first time since Rosh Hashanah. It was a time of fasting and prayer. The nation got together and confessed its sins, sought the Lord. And then the high priest would do this really interesting picture. He would take two goats. And one goat he would sacrifice for the sins of the nation. And then the other goat, he would lay symbolically his hands on the goat. And then he would take this goat so far into the wilderness that it would never find its way back. Do you know what that goat was called? The scapegoat. What we use. Don't make me the scapegoat. Meaning, don't put the blame on me. Well, the picture was this. That when we seek the Lord's face, that He will forgive our sins through the shedding of blood, one through the sacrifice of the goat, and in that forgiveness, He will remove them. He will forget them as far as the east is from the west, never to return. Great picture, isn't it? The only problem was is that it was just a picture. Hebrews tells us that the blood of goats and lambs can never really forgive, but it was a picture of what was to come. It was the law pointing to grace. It was the law pointing to Jesus Christ. No matter how good a picture is, it's just not reality. Pictures are designed for children. And you're like, yeah, but I'm not Jewish, so how does this kind of apply to me? Well, look at verse 3. Paul anticipates that. He says, so also we... While we were children, we were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. So also we. Just because you're not Jewish and you didn't grow up under the Mosaic law doesn't mean we don't have sort of an inner law of our own. A conscience, right? Every country in the world believes murder is bad. Okay, God has written the law on our hearts. But again, that law is not enough to save us. It's only enough to damn us. It's only enough to point out that even our good works are as filthy rags. And what the Galatians were doing here, and hopefully I'm preaching to the choir here, but what we have a tendency to do is say, yeah, 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 we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in His person and work. We, we know that He died on the cross for our sins. We know He's the Son of God. My goodness, we got the manger scene. We celebrate this stuff. And then what do we do? We try to earn our way through good works. Well, God will like me if I do this. Well, hopefully when I get to heaven, he just kind of weighs out my good works and bad works and, and he says, well, come on in. Paul says nothing could be further from the truth. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The best person in the world is still a sinner. 
is still a rebel against God. In this text, the Galatians were trying to reach salvation on their own. There's a great story. If you grew up Methodist, you probably know a lot about John Wesley. Well, John Wesley was an Oxford grad and uh, really had a desire when he was in school to go and become a missionary over in the colonies. And so he came over to Georgia and became a missionary for a while. Uh, He was preaching, he was teaching. But on his way back for a visit, he ran into a terrific storm on the ocean. And he was terrified of death. He was so scared that he was down in the hull of the ship, you know, curled up, scared, shaking. But you know what he heard while he was there? Singing. Loud singing. Joyful singing of hymns. Do you know who was singing? It wasn't the missionary. It was the Moravian sailors. The Moravian sailors who had genuine faith in Jesus Christ. And he said it was at that point that he realized he wasn't really saved. He didn't really believe. Oh, he accepted the facts that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, had to die on the cross, but he was trying to do it on his own. And when he got back to England, he heard a preacher preach the gospel and he became a believer. Listen to his quote here. He says, I who went to America to convert others was never myself converted to God. I even had the faith of a servant, though not that of a son. I'm wondering how many of us are guilty of pre-conversion Wesleyitis, right? We're here today because we're Christians, we're Protestants, Texans, right? All wrapped together. We give lip service to the stories. We believe in a sense, but it's an intellectual sense. But the cost is too great. We've never really repented of our sins and placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And therefore, we have the faith of a child. And I don't mean in a good sense like the faith of a child. I mean the faith that a child who's just told this is what it is. It's not really his own. And so what Paul gives us in this first section, this first picture, is basically saying that in the law of Moses, in the Old Testament, we have a a teacher, we have a tutor, But in fact, we're not really sons yet because it's only shown us how we're lost. But then here's the good news. I like the buts in the Bible, right? The but gods. But the Father has the power to change that. There was a time. There was an exact time. An exact hour, an exact minute that all of this would change. Look at our second point. It's our picture of our adoption as sons. Verse 4. And I love this verse. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Isn't that a great phrase? When the fullness of time came. Augustine said it this way. He said, quote, Christ, who is the creator of time, chose this day to enter into the world of His creation. That there's something that happens. That we end the Old Testament with Jews being in exile under Persia, and we wake up in the New Testament where they're under the heel of Rome, and then there's a decree that goes forth. And God chose this time to send the promise. If He chose the Old Testament to give us the direction to the promise, the big sign that points that the promise is coming, He chose this time to give us the promise. And it says it's the fullness of time. And so it begs the question, why why did God choose 2,000 years ago? Why not sooner? Why not later? Well, I think there's a couple of interesting reasons here that history tells us. Number one, we have the arisal of the synagogue. When 
the uh, temple was destroyed under Nebuchadnezzar, and Jews were taken into Babylon and then subsequently Persia, they didn't have a temple to worship at anymore. And so they started to gather in synagogues. And it only took ten Jewish men to form a synagogue. And they would gather on Shabbat, on Saturdays, and they would spend time reading the Scriptures, and praying, and reasoning and teaching with the Scriptures. What does that sound an awful lot like? What we do here. Yeah. So there was, there was community. There was the teaching of God's Word as authoritative. We also have a universal language at the time. All of the known world spoke Koine Greek, a very simple, common language where you could go anywhere in the Roman Empire and you could speak Greek with someone. How great was that for the 27 books of the New Testament to go like wildfire across the Roman Empire? Thirdly, we have the Pax Romana, economic and political stability with The dawning of Caesar Augustus, we have about 200 years without war. There's peace. You can travel in relative safety. And you can travel via what? Roman roads. Listen to this stat here. At its peak, the Roman road system spanned 53,000 miles and contained 372 links. This was the biggest game changer, along with Koine Greek, in the ancient world to be able to travel anywhere in relative safety, ask people directions, and get by and do business. It changed everything. And so you can see how when, after Christ's death, when there's persecution in Jerusalem and they scatter, where does the gospel go? Where doesn't it go? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, finish it with me, uttermost ends of the earth, right? When the fullness of time came, God who created time chose this time to have His only Son born of a woman. Romans 8.3 For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. I love what a friend of mine, he, he, he would always say this. The Creator became the Redeemer. The Creator became the Redeemer. That's John 1.14. And the Word became flesh and what? Dwelt among us. Literally tabernacled. Pitched a tent among us. And we saw His glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see how things are starting to crescendo here? Let me read Augustine one more time. He wrote this poem. And it just brings it together with regards to the promise, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. He, without whose divine permission no day completes its course, wished to have one day for His human birth. The Maker of man became man that He, ruler of the stars, might be nourished at the breast. That He, the bread, might become hungry. That He, the fountain, might thirst, that He the light might sleep, that He the way might be wearied by the journey, that He the truth might be accused by false witnesses, that He the judge of the living and the dead might be brought to trial by a mortal judge, that He the justice might be condemned by the unjust." that He, the discipline, might be scourged with whips, that He, the fountain, might be suspended upon a cross, that courage might be weakened, that security might be wounded, that life might die. Folks, if we just see Jesus as baby in the manger and miss the purpose of His death and resurrection on the cross, then we are still children being governed by tutors still under the law that points to something greater that we have not yet realized. Christ, as Luther said, sunk Himself into human flesh for a reason. Look at verse 5. So that He might redeem those who are under the law. Now, 
if you're a Roman citizen, if you're just living in the Roman Empire, no one has to explain to you what redeem means. It's an empire with 60 million slaves. Everyone knows that redeem is a commercial term to buy a slave back or out of the slave market. The point Paul is making here is that it's with the promise of Jesus Christ that we are set free. That we are set free from our slavery. And as if, as if that's not good enough news, it gets better. We are also adopted as sons and daughters. So imagine you're a slave and you get purchased out of the slave market and the owner says, take those shackles off. You're free. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. But imagine him now saying, and I want you to come home with me and I want you to be my son. And all that I have is yours. And all that I own is yours. And I give you my name. And I want you to live and represent me. And when I die, I want you to take on the work. Think about that. As a slave, even as a child, we can never jump the barrier to become the adopted son. Gaius is away at school without a father. There's no way he could have ever made this happen. He couldn't have gone to Julius Caesar and said, Hey, uncle, you ever thought about, you know, adopting me at 18? <laughs> God made it happen. God made it happen what we could never. We are not only free from slavery, we are sons and daughters of the one true God. You know, after Julius Caesar's death, he was given divine honors. He was said to be a god. And people began to worship him. Well, as a result, Caesar Augustus minted coins of himself and wrote the words on it, Divi, Phileas, son of a God. As good as Gaius Octavius may have been, the best he could come up with in life was basically to lie on a coin to say that he was the son of a mortal who claimed to be God. How good do we have it that we're actually sons of and daughters. We're actually children of God. Children of the Most High. And as adopted sons and daughters, we not only enjoy all the rights and privileges of our Father, but we also start to look like Him, don't we? We have a next door neighbor who adopted a child some years back. His name is Carson. And it's uncanny. He looks just like his adopted father. And we thought that was just kind of Sort of a coincidence, but as years have gone by, guess what? He looks more like him, and he acts just like him. And yet he's not blood. But isn't that true of us? That when we are brought into the family, we start to look like our Lord, and we start to act like Him. And watch this, we obey the law not because it makes us adopted children, not because this gives us title with Him, but because we love Him. And that's where Paul drives it home. He's basically saying, as adopted children, we obey the law because it's our Father's Word. And we love Him. And we like what He likes. And we hate what He hates. So we've seen this wonderful before picture. Now we've seen this wonderful after picture. And as if it couldn't get any better, look at verse 6. He says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts crying, Abba, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. Adoptions in the Roman Empire required a witness. Paul is saying your witness here 
is the Holy Spirit. He is the pledge, He is the deposit that your inheritance is coming, that you truly are an adopted son. And as such, you have the right to call Him Abba. Abba's not daddy, but it is a familial term. It's like Papa. It's a term of endearment. It's respectful, but yet nearby, genuine, devotional. It's what Christ uses in the Garden of Gethsemane. Abba. All things are possible for you. Please remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, what you will. Abba, Father, he cries out. It's a very interesting term. It's also one that you would cry out when you were uh, in desperate need of help. A good friend of mine, Armour Patterson, son of Paige Patterson at Southwestern Seminary, I grew up with him, and he was always getting in trouble. You know, son of a pastor, right? There's this story when he was in Israel on one of their tours and was apparently bored one night. Everyone went to bed, and he and his buddies stayed up, and they were staying on the coast. And so he and his buddy got flashlights and went out and caught a bucket full of crabs and put them in the hotel pool. And the next morning as he's waking up, looking out the window, pointing towards the pool, he saw this little Arab boy, Abba, 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 crying to his father because of the little crabs coming after him in the pool. And I thought, what a perfect description. What's the most natural term that the son cries out for his natural name? Abba. He wants his daddy. He doesn't just say, you know, father, you know, or call him by his formal name. He calls him Abba because he's a son. Romans 8, verses 15 and 16, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So Let's bring this together. First of all, evangelistically, if you are here today and you're outside the family of Christ, you're no better than a slave. And all of your good works, all of your efforts, all of your desire to obey Scripture will not make you an adopted son any more than Gaius Octavius was able to make himself an adopted son of Julius Caesar. You cannot do it. The law only shows you that you cannot do it. But, while that's the bad news, here's the good news. All who believe in Him, all who repent of their sins and place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ will not be turned away. And that sacrifice that Christ paid on the cross will cover every single one of your sins, no matter how heinous. And you are not just freed from slavery in that moment when you believe, but you are brought into the family as an adopted son, a full son or daughter with all the rights of a child and the inheritance. But this gift of grace is no good unless it is actually taken. Unless it is actually received. No mere intellectual assent will gain you salvation. Not just agreeing with the set of facts will do it. Not saying, I believe. But it is, as we've learned in Matthew, it is the dropping of the nets. It is a transfer of allegiance. And it is following Christ. It's not doing things in order to gain favor with Him. It's saying, I can do nothing Save me, a sinner. And then after we become adopted children, and if you are an adopted child here, then my exhortation to you would be to act like your name. We are sons and daughters of the King. We represent Him. And let's obey not because it saves us, but let's obey because that's who we are. We are children of the King. I pray that this Christmas season, as you are with your friends and family who are not believers, 
that you can share with them what Paul has taught us in this book. That the grace of Jesus Christ not only frees you from slavery, but makes you a child of God. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for showering your grace upon us through the sending of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, your only begotten Son. May we truly celebrate His birth by living for Him, by living as sons and daughters of the Most High. May you receive all of our worship, all of our devotion, and may we live in such a way that honors the name. In His name we pray. Amen.